So, it, you know, we, we talked about earlier, if Jesus, if Jesus isn't for the Jews, right, then he's for no one. If he's not the savior of the world, he isn't the savior of anyone. Hi, everybody. I'm here with a very special guest, my friend Jeff Morgan, who some of you might have known uh, previously. He's been on my channel previously, and I've also been on his channel as well. He is an ex-New Ager, um, and he's also a vegan bodybuilder. He has a YouTube channel called Guilt Free TV that's dedicated to uh, teaching people how to have a healthy lifestyle on a plant-based diet. He is a Jew from birth, and he's a former New Ager as well, who is deeply entrenched in this movement for about 20 years. So after a breakdown, he hit rock bottom. He came to Christ along with his whole family. And he has his, his whole testimony, by the way, on One for Israel as well, if you want to know more about that. Jeff, I asked you to come on today to talk more about the Jewish side of things for people like us who maybe want to understand more about Judaism, about what they believe. I just want to thank you so much for coming on today. Oh, this is fun. Thank you for having me. This is something I'm really interested in as well, because uh, I, I, I've i read the Old Testament many times, a few of us have, and there are still things and questions that I have about Judaism, about uh, Judaism as practiced back then, but especially Judaism today. And as somebody who not only um, you live in Israel and yeah. you are Jewish, and you're also an ex-New Ager, so you kind of have that lumped in. I'm kind of wondering if you could very briefly just give us a background on, on that. Uh, what happened to you? You came through the New Age as a practice, or yeah, you were practicing Jew, correct? No, not necessarily. I grew up in a secular Jewish home. It was a secular Jewish that, home, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so God wasn't necessarily in our conversations. We didn't grow up hearing about God, but we did the traditional... Um, festivities throughout the year, Hanukkah, Sukkot, Passover, or Pesach. Um, so the Jewish holidays were celebrated simply because my, my mom mostly wanted to keep, kind of perpetuate Jewish identity through the, through the generations. Um, but it really had no connection to God himself. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a Christian that goes to church on Easter and Christmas kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. That makes so, sense. So, yeah. So we grew up being, um, secularly Jewish. Um, I didn't really think that much of it. Um, it was, you know, I, I was a little bit bullied when I was younger in school because of it, you know, being a Jewish person. Mm -hmm. But um, I went through the, you know, traditional things. I had my bar mitzvah. Um, I, you know, moved to Israel when I was 24 and ended up falling in love with the country and learned Hebrew. And then over, you know, a few times coming back and forth, that, that's when I met my wife here in Israel. But in my early 20s was when I took a headfirst dive into New Age spirituality. So I hadn't found God in Judaism. I hadn't found God in my home. My parents didn't raise us, you know, to think about God or talk about God. And so when I left home, I, was, I really wasn't, I wasn't set up for success. And I'm not talking about worldly success. I'm talking about emotional success. And, you know, given the, the, the basis of, confidence and the ability to express myself and to work hard um, and those kind of things. So when I left home, I was horribly insecure. And I went to LA to, you know, do my best to try to become some sort of uh, something in the entertainment business, right? To be, be a success in that way. And I just found myself miserable and insecure. And I just, I hated myself. And so New Age spirituality was like the best option for peace that I had had at the time, because I grew up in a home that my parents loved us a lot, but my mom and my, my dad, they were very nervous people. So as we grew up, we were around a lot of anxiety. So when I left house, the home, I was, I was anxious and insecure and New Age spirituality was just like, wow, I can be, I can find peace. I can learn how to meditate. I can learn how to take control of my own emotions. Mm -hmm. I can become aware of my emotions and my thoughts. And a lot of those things are actually good. They don't necessarily need to be tethered to new age philosophy. Um, but I really got deep. I mean, I, 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 I was meditating 30 minutes to an hour a day. I was doing specific, you know, odd poses and mantra meditations. 
I was wearing crystals. I was burning incense. I set up my room in a way where it was just like this salt rock over here and this crystal over there and all these things around me that I could just bliss out on my own because I was single and just by myself. And over time, um, through this all, there was this odd torment that came over me um, during this period of time. I, and it, this is 20 years of, of practice, you know, of, of disciplined, you know, honest practice. And, uh, but I felt this odd torment. Like I had this, this, I thought it was my spirit, you know, my spirit guide talking to me and telling me what to do. So I, I had this, um, it wasn't really an audible voice, but it was just this, this impression and this feeling like do this thing. And if you don't do it, something bad's going to happen. Yeah. And so I went through this whole period of time thinking, well, that must be me connecting with my spirit and my spirit is guiding me in, into this direction and that direction. I better listen or else something bad's going to happen. And this torment plagued me for so long that the honeymoon phase of new age spirituality after that wore off, I started to get through this period where I was getting more depressed and more anxious and more fearful. And as I got into my forties, I started to fear death. Uh, I felt invincible up until that point. And then I started to fear death. And then as soon as I, I, I came face to face with my own mortality, then I started taking my, you know, I started taking my family down with me into depression and anxiety and fear. And once I, like you said earlier, hit bottom, um, Jesus revealed himself to me and my wife and my older son um, at the same time separately. So we would go out of the house and have these amazing experiences that were related to Jesus for like a month and a half every day. We would meet people, see things, get handed something, see something and feel something and watch something. And every day I felt like I was coming back to life. And so long story short, after about a month and a half, um, I thought, wow, I, I want to believe in Jesus, but as a Jewish person, I don't know how to do that. What am I supposed to do? Do I get on my knees? I've seen it in the movies. I've read it in a book. I hadn't even read the Bible yet. What do I do? And we, my wife and I were talking about this and she was feeling the same exact way. She's like, how do I be Jewish and believe in Jesus? I don't want to be a Christian. So in, within us, there was also confusion. You know, how does this work together? So we would watch more testimony videos of uh, Jewish people coming to faith in Jesus as the Jewish Messiah and savior of the world. And once we started to see Jewish, real Jewish testimony, authentic Jewish testimony, we said, okay, we can be Jewish and believe in Jesus. And that was it for my wife. But for me, I still felt tormented because of the dark spirits that were tormenting me from new age practice. And so one night, I, one of my friends who, who's a pastor invited me to church and they were teaching on the transfiguration. And when the pastor said, they're up on the mountain and the, and the, the cloud comes over and God's voice comes out and said, this is my son who I love, listen to him. And as soon as he said, listen to him, my heart blew wide open. And I ran home and I told my wife and I said, honey, it's him, it's him. It's not Buddha. It's not the spiritual teachers of today. It's not these self-help books that I'm reading. It's Jesus. And I knew it was true. I knew it was true. And so when we, when I got home, she told me about this odd dream that she was having about this young kid that was being tormented. And she says, I wasn't going to say anything until you brought up your story again. And she says, but that kid was you. And she pointed to me and she said, that kid was you. You were being tormented this whole time. And I remembered that Bible verse, listened to him. And that was it. Decades of torment, of oppression, of anxiety, fear, hopelessness, and suicidal thoughts fell off me at that one moment. This huge weight just fell off and I got on my knees, what we both did, <laughs> yeah. and uh, gave our lives to Jesus. That's interesting, Jeff, because uh, I, I can kind of understand that. I, I, I kind of had a similar story where I, I, I could not explain how I literally was this one person this one day and I woke up the next day after yeah. trusting Jesus. And I, I didn't know what born again meant. Jesus said, you yeah. must be born again. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know the Bible. And it, I felt new. Like I felt like this new creation. I felt like I had been reborn <laughs> without Same. really yeah. realizing what had just happened. It's all the yeah. depression, all that anxiety. It just, it, it, it never came back quite like it did back then before I, I before I knew Jesus. So that's interesting. Let's talk more about the, the Jewish side of this. So you were sure. talking about how you were struggling with this. And 
one of the things that I've noticed that uh, a lot of people, such as myself, even I admit this, um, I'm, I'm trying to learn more about it, but there's not many Jewish people, you know, around, if that makes sense. It, it's like they kind of, we all kind of stay to ourselves, it seems like. Um, but I would right. love to sit down and talk with a Jewish person. So I am right now to ask you questions about your, their beliefs. <laughs> and uh, that's kind of what I want to talk about is what do, what do Jewish, uh, Jewish people uh, currently believe right now, especially um, about the Messiah and how do they believe someone saved? So, I mean, if you, if you read the old Testament, there's, I mean, it foreshadows the Messiah, everything that, that happens that we see in the new Testament and right. there seems to be very specific things about salvation. How does that all work? Okay, so the, the question of what do Jewish people believe is a really, yeah. really broad question. So it's unanswerable, <laughs> but um, there, because there's different sects, you know, there's ultra, ultra Orthodox, there's Reformed, there's French Jews, American Jews, Ethiopian Jews, Ashkenazi, Sephardic Jews. So the question is really broad, but as a Jewish American myself that grew up in California, um, the most common Jewish um, expression of Judaism, I'm not talking about the Orthodox community, um, is the desire to perpetuate their Jewish identity from one generation to the next. And so what does that mean you know, for us in this life? It, well, you've heard the term l'chaim, right? Or you, you know, cheers, you know, l'chaim, you've heard that. It means to life. Mm -hmm. So most Jewish people are, they're about this life. You know, what does it mean to have a good life? Education, uh, family, heritage, being a good Jewish person, a mensch. You've heard the term mensch. Yes. A lot of people have heard that term, which, yes. which is Yiddish. It's a Yiddish for like a person of, uh, with integrity and honor. Yeah. Um, and, and there's also some overlap in these things with Israelis as well. So living here, I also see that too. Perpetu the perpetuation of Jewish identity through the generations. Mm -hmm. um, how do Jewish people uh, think someone is saved? Well, I would add to that saying, save from what? Hmm. Because it's not a typical Jewish thought. Okay. We, we, didn't, we didn't talk about how to go to heaven as a Jewish family. It's a really, when you think about it, it's a really Christian way to think, okay. you know, being saved. So Jewish people as a whole, they're not thinking about the Messiah, generally speaking. And if they are, it's more of like a messianic age than a person. Okay. You know, so there, there's a belief, there, there's a belief that human beings, you know, as flawed as we are, um, if we work hard enough, we can all get along and like usher in a messianic age. Now it's clear to us that the Bible speaks about a Messiah, a, a person, right? But if you if you think about it, um, there's a history of false messiahs throughout Judaism. So Judaism in general. I'm not talking about certain, you know, this, this, is, this is totally a general, generalization, has de-emphasized messianism, right? So when I talk about the Messiah to the Jewish, Jewish people, um, they're not really concerned with them. You know, they're more focused on how to be a better person, how to treat people with kindness, how to fix the world and usher in maybe a messianic age. But when you think about it, that's us doing something that not only have we not been able to do, human behavior and, and action towards one another has been getting worse over time, not better. You know, if we think That's about true. it, the last hundred years have been the bloodiest hundred years in, in recorded human history. And so if, if the hope lies in man, it's ultimately futile. I mean, we're both ex new agers. Wouldn't you say that sounds kind of similar to our old belief system where it's okay. Yeah. Um, isn't that a problem yeah. though? Like, do they, do they, do they read, do they read the, the Torah? Do they read the old, what we would call the old Testament? And do they understand that that's God talking and like, are there rules there that they follow still? It, it depends. If you're, if you're religious, then yes. And then if you're religious, then there's different levels of, of, of practice there's different levels of following the laws so you have ultra orthodox that try to follow as many as possible as humanly possible without the temple that was destroyed in 70 a.d that it's even harder to follow them all but they they do their best to follow them all. then there's conservative judaism reform judaism and once you start going down and judaism starts to become less religious and more uh modern and social okay then you start following you start following less and less laws 
what I haven't seen in the Jewish community is a necessary care that if you're not following the laws of God, that that's wrong, <laughs> you know, that that's something that it affects you in an eternal way. It's like some people practice more laws. I do Judaism light. I practice a couple of them. I keep the Sabbath, but I don't eat kosher, right? I go to, I, go, I wear a yarmulke, but um, I don't pray every day or I don't read the scriptures. Um, I, I don't work on Saturday, but I light the candles on Friday. So it's like people get to pick and choose what they want, um, which that, that's kind of what I've generally seen. And you know, obviously here in Israel, we have a much greater um, presence of the Orthodox Jewish community. Yes. So you're in Israel right now, which by the way, for yes. the shoddy internet connection, that's pr it's probably because I'm in my shed and that you're thousands of miles away. I've, so yes, you're in Israel. And would you say yeah. that there's a, a difference between how it's practiced in Israel, like the place, the Holy Land, uh, and, uh, than in other places? Like, would you say they're more Orthodox? Yes. Yes and no. Um, the biggest difference is that when you're a Jew in Israel, you don't have to prove it. You don't have to purposefully show your Jewish identity. You are Jewish. You live in Israel. You're at home, right? Uh -huh. So you don't have to actually put something on to show your Judaism unless you're, you're doing a religious act. So in, in America, for instance, where I came from in the States, um, you emphasizing your Judaism was important because if not, you just get swallowed up into the community. That's true. <laughs> it, you, you just assimilated. Yeah. And so the one thing that makes you feel Jewish in a country that is so not Jewish, unless you live in a very concentrated Jewish area, which we didn't growing up, is your practice. You know, lighting the candles, making you sure to light the candles. Even if it's not a religious act, you're doing it for the sake it's of It's like tradition. a cultural thing than a religious a thing. thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, that, that kind of goes into my next question is how, <laughs> speaking of the Messiah, um, I've, I've, I've learned over the years that there's some animosity, lots of animosity towards Jesus in, in this aspect where, um, where a lot of Jewish people, um, first, they, they don't really, they do not see him as the Messiah. And if I'm understanding correctly, there's almost like there's, there's an anger there. There's, there's almost like there's a hostility towards him. How do they see him? And what would you say are some of the biggest misconceptions as somebody who's Jewish and now a Christian um, yeah. that they have about him and vice versa that we would have about how they see Jesus? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, we have the, the general Jewish population, like I spoke about before, which is very diverse. Um, yeah. And then the religious Jewish population, which is also diverse. And so each person in their own diverse way thinks about Jesus in a different way. So let's, for instance, if you're a Jew and you're an atheist, which sounds odd, but you can be because you're a Jew, you could, you're a Jew by birth. Mm -hmm. um, and you're always a Jew, you know, a Jewish, a Jewish person. So I think David um, Silverman was a Jewish and he's the president or former president of the atheist association. So yeah, right, right. So yeah, so you can be an atheist and a Jewish person and you, and you might just not care at all. You know, like Jesus is, you know, the Messiah. I don't, you know, doesn't, it doesn't matter to me. These kind of things don't matter to me. I don't believe in them and they're not real. So it doesn't matter to me. Um, but for the most part, the general Jewish population, which would include the Orthodox, um, would be that Jesus certainly existed. Okay. So they, they, they agree that he existed. Mm -hmm. um, now, if, if you're a secular Jewish person or a reform Judaism, which it's kind of like a combination of, um, scriptural teaching adapted to a more modern era, which is reformed Judaism. So it's like a watered down version of, of Judaism, which says that, well, Judaism needs to adapt to our modern day. Therefore, um, we can kind of believe what we want, let people believe what they want. You know, you do whatever you want as long as you're a good person. So the, 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 the general Jewish population thinks Jesus was a good teacher a good preacher, maybe a rabbi of some sort, mm -hmm. um, but that's it. The general population, that's it. They just leave it there. Not the son of God, not divine. You know, he's not accepted as the Messiah, but just someone who existed and did some interesting things. No need to think about him. Um, some people think that Jesus was the first Catholic. <laughs> um, 
you know, some people call him a good spiritual teacher and he, he was called rabbi, which means teacher. Um, and most don't even consider him. So I, you know, when I was growing up as a, as a Jewish kid, um, I didn't really consider him at all. I didn't really know who he was. Didn't even know he was Jewish. Mm. That makes sense. Now okay. the religious, yeah, the, re the religious group, um, the religious groups on the other hand, um, they can see him as a sorcerer, uh, a deceiver. And in some of the rabbinic interpretations, um, his miracles are in fact accredited, but are denied. Uh, sorry, they're not denied. They're um, just simply accredited to Satan. So in Mark, in Mark 3, um, it's recorded that the scribes said that he's possessed by Beelzebub, right? By the devil. And by the prince of demons, he casts out demons, right? And Jesus replied, well, how can Satan cast out Satan? You know, if a kingdom and how is divided against itself and stand. And so if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he can't stand and is coming to an end. So um, the, the idea that um, the, or the, the religious community would see him as um, satanic or a sorcerer that has been, you know, possessed by Satan or, you know, being controlled by the devil, then it doesn't make sense, you know, and, and it's, it's described in Mark three that way. But um, many religious Jews can see Jesus as cursed. Um, mm -hmm. As we know, his name is used as a curse word ubiquitously around the world, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I think the only one good thing that can come of that is that the name of Jesus will never be forgotten. <laughs> um, you know, we, we, <laughs> <laughs> right. So what we have in Deuteronomy 21, 23 is, um, let's see if, if I can quote this correctly. Cursed is the man and who is hung on a tree. Yes, yeah. Right. That's in first so, Peter. So if you're if you're yeah, so if you're looking through um the Old Testament only and not reading the New Testament, which most Jewish people might do, they might only look through the Old Testament if they look through it. Um and they come across that one, they'll say, well obviously Jesus was cursed, so there's nothing we need to to know about him. Um I think one of the biggest misunderstandings about Messiah was that um he was supposed to come and there would be instant world peace. Hmm. Okay. That's the Jewish perspective. And if he didn't do that, if that, that's the litmus test, right. For Jesus, for, sorry, for the Messiah. If, if the Messiah comes and there's not world peace, that's not the Messiah. But we understand as believers that the Messiah didn't come to bring instant world peace, right. Yeah. As some, as some anticipated him to do, he, he suffered for our mistakes, renewing us and reconnecting us to our creator, Elohim, the source of true peace. Yeah. And so just like when you went, what you went through and what I went through coming to faith in Yeshua, Jesus, as our Messiah and savior of the world, we went through a complete inner transformation. And I have inner peace that I have never felt through 20 years of meditation. I almost wanted to make a video saying I stopped meditating and found peace. I actually think I'm going to do that. That's a great video <laughs> title. You should do that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm right. I'm, I'm starting to write that one up. Another misconception um, is that Jesus is not for the Jews, like we spoke about earlier. Yeah. I was, I was taught that. And the fascinating thing about this is that it's the one and perhaps the only thing that a Jewish person can believe in and not be considered Jewish anymore. As if, as if Jesus was the defining thing of a Jewish identity. A Jewish person can be a Buddhist, a Hindu, and even an atheist. That's interesting. But you can't yeah, be a Christian. Right. He's still considered Jewish. But if you believe in Jesus, you're no longer considered Jewish. By the But way, everything else is so anti-Jewish. How does that, right. how does that work? Right. So, I mean, you're, ha you're an atheist. I don't know. I guess it's because it's a cultural thing. That doesn't make sense to me, but that's very right. interesting well, to know. It's about to make sense because in the minds of many Jewish people, Jesus is responsible for many, many tragedies. Mm. We have the Holocaust, the Crusades, the Inquisition, the pogroms, you name it, it goes on and on. So, How is he to be blamed for that though in their perspective? Right, okay. because, because these things have been done in his name, right? Well, lots the of things have been have done, these... done in people's names that haven't been actually something that they would be for, obviously. Like Hitler was not a Christian. He did not worship right. a Jew, <laughs> you know? Right. like So that was, that was well, done he, he really- hated Christianity. He hated Christianity. If you read a little bit about him, you'll realize he hated Christianity. Yeah, so, so anyway, sorry, sorry to interrupt. No, no it's great. It's, it takes a little digging, 
Yeah. Right. But Jewish people see Christians and Catholics as the enemy. Hmm. And, and when you have a people that have been, this is kind of interesting because Jewish people don't usually think about this. The Jewish people have been brutally treated throughout the centuries, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But so have Christians, so have Christians, right? Yeah. And so they believe the New Testament to be anti-Semitic. Because but- why would these actions come out of Christian populations towards us if the New Testament is not anti-Semitic? How else could we understand why, Christ- why Christians also have historically hated Jews so much? We right? have. If you, if you, <laughs> well, you see, that's the thing. We have to um, look at it for what it is. Yeah. Cultural history hate is cultural hate yes. getting on the bandwagon of what a culture is doing and whatever scapegoat they're using is not biblical we know that yes yeah that's but kind it, of what's a, happening right now in america with critical race theory right it's interesting yeah right so a jewish to... person doesn't understand that a jewish yeah. person doesn't know what a real christian is yeah all jewish people have seen throughout history is in the name of jesus we are killing jewish people and we are raiding Jewish villages, and we are cleaning up the world. Now, it, like I said before, if you just do a little bit of digging, then you know that this, not, this is not the case, right? Yeah. My so, perspective is very different on that because I, I right. have great reverence for Jewish people. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Great reverence, respect. And yeah. I, I couldn't imagine that. Right. So, so a lot of people, a lot of people that would say that they're Christians aren't necessarily biblical Christians, uh, Mm -hmm. Jesus following Christians. They're just, there may be, they might be like we said, there's cultural Jews, there's cultural, it's hard to say Christians because they're not, you know, cultural Christians, you know. They're cultural Christians, yeah. You just have to say it for what it is, Yeah. right? So, So when you have people that love Jesus so much and you see people that hate Jesus so much and then a public movement starts. And let's say in, within this public movement, your, your safety or life is threatened because of your belief. Yeah. You, in order to save your own life, will jump on the public a bandwagon, adopt the public policy, and just go with the flow even if you don't think it's right. But then there are those that don't follow that trend. Yeah. And they don't, they don't, they, they consider their own safety, but they don't put it before the teachings and the following of Jesus. Yeah. Right. And we can talk about it later about other examples of Christians that have given their lives to save Jewish people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I, I mean, for me, it's hard to wrap my head around because then we're going to talk about this. Maybe we should right now. It's a natural segue is how Jesus was Jewish and, and right. every, every new Christian that followed Jesus in the new Testament they were all Jews, save Luke. Luke was a Gentile, but um, the first converts to Christianity were, were very Jewish. And and Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, is a very the New Testament's a very Jewish book. Right. And uh, maybe you could talk about that, like the Jewishness of Jesus and the first, especially the New Testament church, which were virtually all Jews until they went to the Gentiles. Paul went to the yeah. Gentiles. Yeah. Well, if you think about it. There was no such thing as Christianity in the beginning of all. Of yeah, all there wasn't. Yeah, this was this was a Jewish movement. If you look at it, okay, <laughs> this is one of my favorite things to talk about, and it's quick. Yeah, but a, a lot of the Jewish people say today, "How can you be Jewish and believe in Jesus?" Okay, that's what a lot of Jewish people say today. But then, the big question, as as as, um, you can't call it Christianity; they called it the way. They called it the way yeah. at that time, the followers of the way, right? Mm-hmm. Followers of Jesus at that time, they were seeing Gentiles and Greeks, basically Gentiles, Greeks, non-Jewish people coming to faith in the God of, of the Hebrews, the God of the Hebrew Bible. Yeah. And they were saying, how can you be Gentile and believe in Jesus? This is a Jewish movement. So you see through the epistles, you see a lot of the conflict yeah. between how, how do, well, if I'm Gentile, do I have to be observant Jew? If I'm a Jewish person, can I, can I intermingle with the Gentile believers? Can, you know, and all of these um, um, arguments 
Mm-hmm. You know, Paul had to do a lot of cleaning up with regards to these these issues. Yes, he did. Were, <laughs> he wrote about them. <laughs> yeah, which were which were big issues. Yeah. And so yeah. the, the question at the time was not can you be Jewish and believe in Jesus? Can you be Gentile and believe in Jesus? And over the years, this has changed. Yes. And you mentioned replacement theology. We can get yes. to that in a minute. But yeah. I like to talk about how, I mean, this was uh, Jew, Jesus was was considered an observant Jew. Yes. He was even called a rabbi. He was, he, right? he celebrated like, the, the celebrations, everything. Yeah, the Passover and everything. And the, the Passover is just like the quintessential story of salvation, you know, where he, you know, at, at Passover, Jewish people raise the matzah and they raise the cup and they don't know that it's literally connected to the body and the blood of the Messiah that gave his life on Passover yeah. to yeah. save us from our sins and give us eternal life. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, even some of the symbols in the Passover meal, as a believer, they're extremely clear that they point to Yeshua, Jesus. So, it, you know, we, we talked about earlier, if Jesus, if Jesus isn't for the Jews, right, then he's for no one. If he's not the savior of the world, he isn't the savior of anyone. Okay. Mm-hmm. So if we know that through the Jewish people would come, you know, Hope we, I mean, we, we know this, right? But a lot of people don't know that, that, that the hope for the whole world would come through the Jewish people. Yes. The Messiah, son of David, son of Abraham. Okay. The Messiah is going to be coming through the line of David. Okay. So <clears throat> the question is, you know, is Jesus who he said he was, right? Is he the Messiah? Yeah. If he's the Messiah, of the Jewish people, then he's the savior of the world. Okay. If he's not the, the, the Messiah of the Jewish people, then he's not the savior of the world either. So what a Jewish person is saying, when they say, I have my religion, I'm totally fine with it. Leave me alone. You have Christianity. Christianity is great for you. But what they're really saying is when they're saying that, that Jesus is not the Messiah is they're saying that Christianity is an entirely false religion. Because if Jesus is not the Jewish Messiah, he's not the savior of the world. Therefore, he's not the savior of Christians and there's no savior. Okay. Does that make sense? It does. My wheels are turning. This, this yes. is good. Yeah. 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 So if, if, if Jesus isn't for the Jews and we read in um, um, uh, Romans 1 16, you know, to the Jew first and then the Gentile, the Gentile. if yeah. he's not, if he's not to the Jews, he's not to the Gentiles either. Okay. Yeah. And, and some would actually argue um, that the word to the Jew first, you, you, you're so familiar with this, this passage, um, to the Jew first doesn't, it may not necessarily mean first in sequence. It can also mean primarily, okay? Especially for, primarily for, and it can also mean firstly for, right? In, in order of sequence, right? So there's some discussion around the world. I have a fantastic pastor. He's brilliant out here. We study the Bible in Hebrew, which is just a blessing to be able to mm. do because we get to look at Greek. We get to look at Hebrew. We get to look at English yeah. and we get to understand things on a, on a, on a deeper, more personal level. Right. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. And so we see, we see the word um, for first to the Jew first in Greek is proton. If you look at the word, it's, it's proton, which has different meanings, right? It can mean first in sequence and it can also mean primarily. And so Jesus is for the Jews. And if he's not, he's for nobody. Okay. And then the question is, is, is Jesus the prophesied one in the old Testament or not? Right. Cause we can debate prophecy. Um, some people like to do it. Some people don't. Um, and if you do an honest study of the old Testament, right. In an old Testament prophecy, especially passages like Isaiah 53, uh, starting with 52, Micah 5, 2, Psalm 22, and so on and so on. And you read the text as it is it's clear who it's referring to. So how, so again, that's the thing, I guess I'm, so we talked about, and you you laid a good foundation for this with Jewish people and how they have a more of a cultural belief, some of them, than um, an Orthodox as far as that goes, but they all generally understand these things. Um, I guess my question is, is how do you miss that? I mean, if you're an Orthodox Jew and you're reading the Old Testament, is it, and you come across Isaiah 53, Okay. I mean, you come across that passage. What does it take to suppress that so that you don't see? Okay. So, so how do you miss it? Right. 
Yeah. It's not necessarily miss it. There are brilliant people in every walk of life, in every tradition, in every culture, in every philosophy, there are brilliant people. Amen. Brilliant does not make for truth. Okay. Let's just get that out of the way. A brilliant person may be a murderer. A brilliant person may be a, a uh, architect of the final solution of the Holocaust. Okay. So the German population at the time of World War II was one of the most brilliant societies and cultures in the world at the time. And they did a massive amount of horrific, horrific, horrible things with that intelligence. So That's let's true. just get intelligence, um, intelligence out of the way. So it's not that you miss it. It's that your religion creates a story that explains it in a different way. Okay. So for instance, okay. um, the Messiah for the Jewish people, um, what is, is to, to, to Messianic or Christian Jewish people is Jesus. Okay. Okay. Yes. Now for someone who is, uh, now, if you're looking at Isaiah 53, for instance, um, a religious Jewish person might look at that and say, oh, well, my rabbi taught me, or as a rabbi saying that is, the, it's talking about the Jewish people, the nation oh, of, uh, of the Jewish I've heard this people. argument before. Okay. okay. Right. So there's different arguments and everybody has a fantastic explanation for their argument. So, so where you lie with regards to your philosophy, your religious beliefs, you will go either way towards whatever fantastic and brilliant explanation you hear. Mm -hmm. For me, for instance, I would hear those things growing up and say, okay, makes sense. Yeah, I get it. Okay, cool. I guess I'll believe that as a Jewish person. When I was born again through no effort of my own and I gave my life to Jesus Yeshua with all of my heart, my eyes were open, my heart was open and I could finally see things clearly and say, oh, it's obvious. But I needed the spirit of God to do that for me. Hmm. It wasn't obvious to me, mm -hmm. which is why we need to pray for the Jewish people. Yeah. Right. Because we want God to open their hearts and their minds and their eyes like they open mine, open mm -hmm. their ears so they can hear their eyes so they can see like he opened mine mm -hmm. so they can be saved and free. One of Paul's uh, biggest uh, desires was that his Jewish people would be saved, yeah. which can take us into replacement theology. I was just going to ask you, yes, please talk more about what is replacement theology. Some people may not know what that is or why it's a problem, <laughs> but um, yeah. So let's talk about that. Cause that's, that's a natural segue into what I wanted to ask you next. Yeah. Well, I'd like to hear from you, the Christian perspective of replacement theology, like, like from the Gentile perspective. Uh, Christian My understanding perspective. of replacement theology is that the church has replaced the Jewish people in essence, yeah. whenever it comes to, I, I don't, I can't say I agree with that. Um, the more that I'm learning about this and eschatology and, um, you know, just the, like the book of revelation, all this stuff is just the more I'm like, no, God is not done with the Jewish people. Like the, that's, that was his people, you know, and oh, yeah. there wasn't this massive, all these books in the old Testament written just to replace, a, replace them with the church. And, but yeah, basically that's, that's what it is. So if you read uh, yeah. uh, Romans, if you read uh, uh, certain parts of Revelation, depending on your understanding of your end times, your eschatology beliefs, or um, just where the church stands, maybe if you're reformed, a lot of Calvinists have different beliefs about this as well. But the belief is yeah. that the um, church, the Christians, the, belief, the body of Christ has basically, oh, God says, I'm done with, with Israel and I'm going to replace it with the church. I don't believe that. Yeah. So first of all, it's a, it's a contradiction of the gospel to say the church replaces Israel. Okay. And like you said, Romans is a great, it's a great place um, to look regarding replacement theology. Uh, Romans two talks about why the Jewish people are under the wrath of God and, and need the gospel. Romans 11, 28, 29 talks about how Israel is unsaved yet beloved right? Mm -hmm. Beloved. Mm -hmm. um, I know some, I know some Christians that think that Israel had their chance and blew it, but scripture doesn't support that. You know, I, I and, and one of the things that, that I think um, supports it the most that replacement th theology is not correct mm -hmm. is that I, I believe in eternal security. Okay. Mm -hmm. I believe it's crucial. It's crucial in the gospel because it, it means that I don't, 
earn my salvation and that it's a gift from God. Okay. So the gifts of God, we know are irrevocable. Yes. Mm -hmm. And to believe that God has rejected Israel because they didn't receive Jesus is inconsistent about what I believe in the gospel. So Paul in Romans 11 says that currently the nation of Israel are enemies of the gospel, which means what? It means they need Jesus, They're but they are like beloved. The the world. <laughs> yeah. Right. They are beloved for the sake of the fathers, the patriarchs. Yes. Okay. Yes. Because the yes. gifts of God are irrevocable. Yes. The calling of God is irrevocable. And if we believe in replacement theology, we have no business believing in eternal security. So I'm, I'm a fairly new believer. We're talking a few years. Uh -huh. And one of the things that I've come to cherish is that I can't lose my salvation. Okay. Yeah. Because it's a, it's a gift from God. I was so fearful of death before I came to faith in Jesus. And now uh -huh. I have this hope that just gives me so much peace. Right. And it's not a hope like I hope I make it. It's a hope for the future, which yeah. I know is coming right? So if theologian, theologians are going to be consistent and believe in replacement theology, they can't teach eternal security. And we have, we have Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, especially verse 8, that says, for grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It's the gift from God. Mm -hmm. And if we go back to Romans eleven twenty eight, 28, it says the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. Mm -hmm. So you can't avoid that, right? I'm glad that you mentioned that because I think that a lot of people, the the love that a lot of Christians have for the Jewish people, I think is important to mention the love and yeah, respect. Um, it's on par with in, in my, in my world anyway, I mean, a lot, every Christian I know, it's like, there's almost like this reverence, like a respect for the Jewish people because it's through the Jew, Jews that the Messiah came and we believe yeah. Jesus as the Messiah. And yeah. it all, it's just a perfect interwoven story when looking at the Jewish scriptures, you know, the old Testament, and then you read the new Testament and there's just this natural respect that you have. I mean, the authors of the new Testament were Jewish and, yeah. you know, so there, there's this, that, that respect that goes there. I have seen more love from the Christian community towards me as a Jewish person and towards my family as a Jewish family and towards the Jewish people than I've ever seen from any other community towards the Jewish people. I mean, I just have to say that because yeah. I came to faith through Gentile Christians that were bold enough to come to this Jewish man in the gym of all places and share with me the love of Jesus to the point where we would actually, after I came to faith, we would be praying in the gym together. Wow. Three, four, five men standing in a circle in the middle of all the weights where people around us are cussing, lusting, flirting, and all kinds of, uh, of things. And we're in the middle of the gym praying for one another. Hmm. praying for each other, praying for our days, praying for our families. And it was such a beautiful experience that I'd never felt and, and experienced before. I mean, men getting together in the gym, <laughs> weights clanking, and we're praying to Jesus and praying to God. So um, I wanted to talk about, you know, the love of Christians. Um, the example of the Ten Boom family, you've heard, you, you, you've heard of the Ten Boom family, Corey Ten Boom. I'm um, sure. There's a movie, a movie called, there's a movie called The Hiding Place. Um, and it talks about this family, the Ten Boom family, that oh, resisted yes. that cultural flow during World War II um, to reject the Jewish people, and they put their lives at risk by, say, by, by hiding Jewish people, okay, mm -hmm. during the Holocaust, and they were even taken to prison, prison where Casper Ten Boom died, and a concentration camp where Corey Ten Boom and her sister Betsy went because of they were aiding um, the Jewish people, mm. right? And, and Betsy ended up dying in the concentration camp um, as a result of them hiding Jews during the Nazi persecution. So this is just one of many, many stories of Bible-believing, Jesus-following, Jewish people-loving Christians that died to save Jewish people. And like I mentioned before, a great movie to watch is that movie, The Hiding Place. Mm -hmm. So check that movie out. Yeah. Um, and, and I think... You know, if, if, if we want to help Gentile Christians, and if, if you're out there watching, you don't know what the word Gentile means. It just means not Jewish. Yeah. Okay. If you, you want to know. Yeah. Yeah. But we're one, you know, one in Christ, mm -hmm. you know, one in Jesus. So Jeff, I wanted to ask you as well, uh, whenever somebody, a Christian is talking to a Jewish person, and maybe they don't know a lot about what they would believe, whether they're an Orthodox Jew or whether they are a cultural Jew or whatever. I'm wondering if you can give us some advice on how to talk to them 
about Jesus, uh, maybe some do's and don'ts, maybe some things that they would find offensive or yeah. methods that you would find effective, things like that. Yeah. Um, the first thing is that when talking to a Jewish person, if a Jewish person is watching this and listening, this is not an attempt to catch you, to convert you, to take you from your religion and bring you into another religion. This is not it. Mm. Okay. So when Jewish believers talk with Jewish non-believers, it's, well, to us, it seems very natural for a Jewish person to believe in the Jewish Messiah. Okay. So it still stays within the boundaries of, of, of a Jewish person's life. Okay. It's a, um, it's an expression, a thriving expression of Jewish life to believe in the Jewish Messiah. Okay. So, but when, when a, um, a Gentile person is talking to a Jewish person, they may not be sensitive about certain um, words that might have negative connotations because of, you know, the past, okay? And because of certain anti-Semitic treatment, all right? Um, and so Jewish people are sensitive to certain terms that have carried this negative, you know, connotation. Um, and it simply, it simply feels more at home for a Jewish person to hear things like Messiah, okay? Or Yeshua, which is Jesus' yeah. name in Hebrew, right? Instead of Christ, right? I was asking a really dear friend of mine, do you know what the word Christ means? And he said, cross? <laughs> and I said, no, I said, it means Messiah. And he said, really? I said, yes, <laughs> it means Messiah, right? Christian means follower of Messiah. Yeah. Okay, it's not... Christ is not the last name of Jesus, right? Yeah. He, he didn't yeah. come from Mr. and Mrs. Christ, right? So, you know, Jesus Christ, it doesn't ring well in the, in the ear of a Jewish person. Yeshua HaMashiach or Yeshua yeah. the Messiah feels more at home, okay? Sounds better. Um, we don't, <laughs> yeah, we don't use the word convert because we don't believe that a Jewish person believing in Jesus is converting into anything. They're simply uh, expressing their faith in the Jewish Messiah, Okay. okay, so if we use terms like come to faith in Messiah, believing in Yeshua, become a follower of Jesus, okay? Mm -hmm. um, baptism is another one of those things that's really, really um, closely connected with, the, with, the, uh, with Catholicism. And so we might say immersion. I see. In Hebrew, they use the term mikveh, which is, uh, you know, the ritual bath, you know, that they use for cleansing. Um, not that a, you know, a, uh, a Gentile Christian would come up to a Jewish person and say, Hey, you know, maybe if you believe in Jesus, you'll have a mikveh, you know, <laughs> that really would... zealous Christian, they're just taking notes and they're just going to go to their Jewish neighbor and use all these terms. Right. <laughs> right. Now, when, when, when my Gentile Christian friends came to me and were talking about Jesus, they did, they weren't sensitive about it, but I didn't care. Okay. Cause I, I wasn't, I wasn't concerned about my Judaism. I was, I wanted to die. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they were preaching life. And when I heard life, I said, I love, I like that. I want that. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, there's also other phrases like, um, okay, the term Jew. Okay. Mm -hmm. The term Jew during the Holocaust was a racial um, um, term that was used in a very derogatory way. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if a Christian is saying, oh, the Jews or you Jew or whatever, it can be taken in a negative context. Okay. So we usually use the word Jewish people. It's more, it's just a more sensitive way of saying Jew. Okay. Um, the words like saved and sanctification, we're not using, uh, usually Jewish people don't usually use. I do because, you know, I'm a Christian Jew, so yeah. I just use them, you know, but some Jewish believers don't. I know Orthodox, I've met Orthodox Jews that are believers in Yeshua and Jesus. So they, and, and they don't, you know, they don't use those words. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Virgin Mary, right? Those kinds of things. You know, her name in Hebrew was Miriam, Miriam, right? Yeah. Yeshua's mom was named Miriam. You know, it's a very Jewish name. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and the term Christianity itself, it's it's a term that's like a completely separate religion and, and totally non-Jewish. So, and and the interesting thing is that the New Testament never even uses the term Christianity. And 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 a Christian, you know, like we said before, only means um, follower of Messiah or Mishichi. They, were, they didn't right. choose to be called Christian. They were called Christian in a derogatory way. So that's right. So th those sensitivities are, are helpful. Yeah. And at the same time, we pray. I, 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 um, I have my YouTube channel. Yes. And I, and I created most of my content before I came to faith. 
okay? Before I put my faith and hope in Yeshua, okay? Yeah. And after I came to faith, you have no idea how many comments I received from people that had been praying for me while watching my videos. That's really cool. And it, it literally brought me to tears, right? That people would think that much of me to pray for me that didn't know me. And after I came to faith, they were just jumping for joy. We've been praying for you for the last two years. We've been praying for you. We've been praying for you. And, and it just, uh, that it warms me my heart. That's so, that's great. Yeah. I'm so grateful for the um, Gentile Christian community that follows Jesus with all their hearts, that doesn't succumb to social pressure and reads the Bible and follows our Lord and does whatever they can to, you know, just love on the Jewish people. And that's one of the biggest things. If you're talking to a Jewish person, love mm -hmm. them, try to understand them you know, listen to them. You know, it reminds me of Jeff is uh, my, when I first got started in ministry, it was a counter cult ministry to Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. And they yeah. have their own language. And there was just the, the whole list that you went over. It's the same thing. It's like, there's, a, there's effective ways to reach them and ineffective ways to reach them. And the language is different. So if you really want to try to reach your Jehovah's Witness neighbor, try these things. Don't use these words. Use this word. This makes sense to them. This doesn't make sense to them. This is what they right. do and when you use this word. It's not like it takes right. work and homework. It's not like you're trying to trick them. It's just no. it's like it's like going to China and 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 not learning a single word of Chinese, not eating Chinese food, looking for the burger joint, doing absolutely nothing to become a part of that culture. Yes, so, it's a know, religious culture that you're trying to understand. I'm a really good friend. He's, he's, a, he's my pastor out here and we, we, have a, we work out together. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to work out with my pastor. Um, so um, he, he has, he's married to a, a Chinese woman who, mm. who is also a believer, right? And he said, it would be like marrying my, my Chinese wife who I love so much and hating her family and hating her culture. Mm. As soon as I married my wife, I bought into her family and I bought into her culture. You can't marry someone and hate everything else about them. It doesn't work. If a Christian is following the Jewish Messiah and hating the Jewish people, it's like, it, it, it doesn't work. That's a great analogy. Right? You, have, you have to love them into the kingdom. And I was fortunate enough to meet people that loved me so much that they told me the truth and God and his spirit opened my eyes, my ears, and my heart and put his Holy spirit within me and, and saved me. Jeff, this has been absolutely fascinating and amazing. I could talk to you all day about this stuff. Spoiler. We were supposed to go 30 minutes. We went an hour. I could easily go another two hours talking about this. There's so much to learn. Um, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. And I'm wondering if there's a place where people can get a hold of you. I know you have a YouTube channel and an Instagram, correct? Yeah. So I have my YouTube channel, which is Guilt Free TV, which is fitness, food, and faith. And I have an Instagram account as well. Um, I make some really fun content that has to do with, you know, working out and food. And, and I just love talking about Jesus. So I, I do that. I live in Israel. So we have a video coming up that we were filming today. You can see my face is all red. I was, <laughs> and I was in Caesarea all day today filming oh, that's two right. videos. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I sent you a picture. Yeah. Yeah. That was um, cool. filming, filming two videos out in the sun and I got a little bit sunburned. Um, but yeah, we have a really fun video coming up soon, which uh, me and my work buddy, um, Elisha, filmed uh, with regards to Paul's imprisonment in mm. uh, Caesarea. So yes, we're doing, we did an update video for that. And also for my channel, we, we talked about health and, and, and some fitness stuff, but, you know, ultimately, um, you know, we, we were standing in the amphitheater there, that's 2000 year old structure. And I'm like, this is still standing and people are dying like this, right? We, these buildings stand the test of time, but human beings don't. So health and fitness is good. But in the book of Timothy, it, it says how, um, exercise has its value, mm. but godliness has value for all things in yeah. this life and the life to come. And so, that. Yeah. yeah, it's basically saying like, it's good to be healthy. It's good to take care of everybody, but ultimately we're going to die. So, you know, <laughs> let's, let's put our hope and trust in something that's a little bit more reliable. Amen. So, um, yeah, so guilt free TV, Instagram, guilty, guilt free TV, YouTube, uh, your videos up on there. Uh, mm -hmm. the one we did together, which was, which was really fun. Yeah, it was fun. I'll put and, that in the uh, comments below as well. So, yeah. So I work for a global nonprofit, which is called Jews for Jesus. Um, I do ministry with them and 
you know, what Jews for Jesus does um, is they, well, we, we raise awareness of Jesus as the Jewish Messiah, right? And faith in Jesus as a viable and thriving expression of Jewish life. So, you know, we exist, you know, all over the world and in over a dozen cities around the world. And we, we facilitate Jewish community. We, we offer spiritual care and local services. We help the poor and the homeless. Um, we do all kinds of social work, um, which, is, which is wonderful. And um, I have my own, if you want to contact me personally, I have my email address, which is Jeff dot morgan at jewsforjesus.org yeah yeah so you can contact me personally that way cool. um if you want to um you know if you're interested in supporting my you know ministry work and um if you're jewish and you're watching this um i just wanted to say i thank you for watching i believe we all have the freedom to seek the truth about jesus yeshua with an open heart um instead of that having that decision be made for us by rabbis two thousand years ago so mm. you know open a new testament you know, and you'll see how Jewish it, it really is. And, and, and there's, oh gosh, there's, 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 it doesn't get any more Jewish than, you know, this is the genealogy of Jesus, mm -hmm. the Messiah, son of David, son of Abraham. Okay. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get any more Jewish than that. And that's the first sentence in the new Testament mm -hmm. in the book of that's Matthew, the first sentence yeah. in the book of Matthew. Right. So if you're listening to this, don't be afraid, you know, open up a New Testament and you'll just see how Jewish it is and how it is the fulfillment of the Tanakh. OK, the Tanakh is the the Hebrew scriptures, right? The Torah, the prophets and the writings. OK, it's the fulfillment of the Tanakh and that Jew Yeshua really is the Jewish Messiah and that he died and he rose from the dead so that we could be reconciled to our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob by the final sacrifice to be set free from the bondage of sin and death. So Amen. if you're watching this and, and, if, and if you're a Gentile Christian and you're watching this, um, just try to get an idea of Jewish culture and terminology that's off-putting to Jewish people. And most of all, just love who you're talking to. Be positive, don't go down any negative routes. Mm -hmm. You know, focus on the new man, Jew and Gentile together, grace of God, keep Jesus as the center. Um, and if you don't feel like you can witness to a Jewish person, if you're shy, if you're, if you don't feel like you can do it, you can support organizations that do like Jews for Jesus, for instance. Yeah, that's true. I thank you so much, Jeff. This is great. Sounds awesome. Thank you so yeah. much for having me. I really yeah, appreciate for, it. 